Ladies and gentlemen, graduating seniors, I want you to know that I am honored to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker today, the Honorable John Lewis. Congressman Lewis has served as U.S. Representative of Georgia's 5th Congressional District since being elected in November 1986. Currently, he serves as a senior deputy whip for the Democratic Party and is a member of the Ways and Means Committee. Congressman Lewis has dedicated his very life to protecting human rights and securing civil liberties for all. He began on that journey of dedication at a very young age. A native of my home state of Alabama, he was inspired by the activism of the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott and the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This inspiration led him to become actively involved in the civil rights movement. His involvement ranged from organizing sit-ins to participating in Freedom Rides, to helping form and chair the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Congressman Lewis even helped orchestrate and participated as a keynote speaker at the historic March on Washington. He was brutally attacked. on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in a peaceful march. To try and help secure voting rights. Despite more than 40 arrests, physical attacks, and bodily injuries, Congressman Lewis remained a devoted advocate of the philosophy of nonviolence. A graduate of Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, and the American Baptist Theological Seminary, Congressman Lewis has received numerous awards, numerous awards, including the Martin Luther King Jr. Nonviolent Peace Award, the only John F. Kennedy Profile in Courage Award for Lifetime Achievement, and the Medal of Freedom, which was presented to him by President Barack Obama. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today has often been called the most courageous person in this, that the civil rights movement ever produced. He clearly is an American hero uh, but I want you to know I call him a longtime friend. Please join me in welcoming our 2015 commencement speaker, Congressman John Lewis, an American hero. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. President Harvey, member of the Board of Trustees, distinguished faculty of Hampton University, parents, family, and friends, and to the class of 2015, I'm delighted and very pleased to be with you on this special and very important occasion. I want to recognize my friend and my beloved colleague and a brother, your congressperson, Congressman Bobby Scott, who is the best. Thank you, Bobby, for being here. Mr. President, yes, President Harvey, yes, I know 
this is not the way to speak at a graduation, but the president, your president is a close friend. He's my homeboy. <laughs> a few days ago, I had the great pleasure of being in, uh, in California. And I was invited by Tim Cook, the head of Apple, to come by and see him. And I said, I call him homeboy. So if I can call Tim Cook homeboy, I can call Bill Harvey homeboy. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your leadership and your vision. I feel more than lucky, but I feel very blessed and honored to be here on the campus of Hampton University. I must tell each one of you graduating today, you look good. You look beautiful. You look, you look handsome. You look smart. And some of you look very colorful. As graduates of this important institution, your professors have taught you a great deal. On this campus, you are unlocking the secret of cancer in the larger proton therapy institute in the world. You know how to build a satellite and get it launched into Harvard. You know the rich history of leadership that is the cornerstone of African-American advancement. But I want to tell you that I didn't grow up in a big city like Hampton. I didn't. I didn't grow up in a big city like Atlanta or Richmond. I didn't grow up in a big city like Norfolk or Washington, D.C. or Baltimore. I grew up on a farm in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four, how many of you graduate remember when you were four? What happened to the rest of us? My father has saved $300, and with the $300, he bought 110 acres of land. My family still own this land today. <laughs> on this farm, we raised a lot of cotton, a lot of peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. I know some of you as graduates love chicken, but you don't know anything about raising chicken, do you? You like to eat a piece of chicken from time to time? But let me tell you what I had to do as a young boy growing up in rural Alabama during the 40s and the 50s. I had to take the fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the set in hand, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. I know some of you smart, gifted students are not saying, John Lewis, why do you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest, and there would be some more eggs. Fresh eggs had to tell the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting hen. Do you follow me? You don't follow me, it's okay. So when the little chick would hatch, I would fool these setting hens, I would cheat on these setting hens. I would take the little chicks and give them to another hen. I put them in a box with a lantern and raise them on their own. I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive incubator or hatcher from the Susan Roebuck store. You're so young, you don't know anything about the Susan Roebuck catalog, that big book, that heavy book, that thick book, the Susan Roebuck catalog. Some people call it the ordering book. Other people call it the wish book. I wish I had this, I wish I had that. I just kept on wishing. But as a little boy, I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to preach the gospel. So from time to time, with the help of my brothers and sisters and cousins, we would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard. And my brothers and sisters and cousins were lying the outside of the chicken yard. But along with the chickens, they would help make up the audience the congregation. And when I look back on it, some of the chicken would bow their heads. Some of the chicken would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to in the 40s and the 50s, 
tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listened to me in the day in the Congress. And some of those chicken were just a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. Well, that's enough of that story. When we visited the little town of Troy, when we visited Montgomery, when we visited Tuskegee, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. 15 years old in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on old radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to find a way to get in the way. And I got in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. So I come here to say to you as graduate, you must find a way to get in the way. You must find a way to get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Use your education. Use it for good. Use it to bring about a nonviolent revolution, not only here in America, but around our world. You have been prepared to go out there and push and pull, and you must do it. Let me tell you, when I was growing up, 15 years old, In the 10th grade, 1955, we went downtown to the little town of Troy, to the public library, trying to check out some books, trying to get library cards. And we were told by the librarian that the library was for whites only and not for colors. I never went back to that library until July 5th, 1998, by the time I'm in the Congress for a book signing of my first book, Walking with the Wind, and hundreds of blacks and white citizens showed up. After the book signing, they gave me a library card. It says something about the distance we've come and the progress we've made. I was telling some of the honorees earlier that when President Barack Obama was elected, was standing in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Church in Atlanta speaking, and I look out the corner of my eye, my right eye, and I saw that he had been elected, and I started crying, and people kept asking me, why are you crying so much? Tom Brokaw came to Atlanta to interview some of us. He said, why are you crying so much? Why did you cry so much, John? I said, there are tears of happiness. He said, well, what are you going to do when he's inaugurated? I said, if I have any tears left, I'm going to cry some more, and that's exactly what I did. Sometimes we have to cry tears of joy, tears of happiness. Just think, the same hands that picked cotton, plucked tobacco, those same hands helped elect the first African-American president of the United States of America. But you're almost, you almost, you got to remember a few short years ago, many of our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers, many of our grandparents and great-grandparents couldn't register to vote. Many of our teachers, our lawyers, and our doctors could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. In our native state of Alabama, in one county, they were asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar soap to count the number of jelly beans in a jar. People stood in unmovable lines. 50 years ago, just think, on a Sunday afternoon, beautiful Sunday afternoon like this Sunday afternoon, 600 innocent children of God, men and women and some very, very young people left on a march to walk from Selma to Montgomery. Only on with a dream. I was wearing a backpack before it became fashionable to wear backpacks. In that backpack, I had two books. 
I thought we would be arrested and go to jail, so I wanted to have something to read. I had one apple and one orange. I wanted to have something to eat. I had toothpaste and a toothbrush. I wanted to be able to brush my teeth while I was in jail. We get to the highest point on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Down below, we saw a sea of blue, Alabama State Troopers. And we continued to walk, and we came within hearing distance of the state troopers. And a man identified himself and said, I am Major John Clyde of the Alabama State Troopers. This is an unlawful march. It will not be allowed to continue. I give you three minutes to disperse and return to your homes or to your church. The young man walking beside me from Dr. King's organization by the name of Jose Williams said, Major, give us a moment to kneel and pray. And the Major said, troopers advance. You saw these men putting on that gas mask. They came toward us, beating us with nightsticks and bull whips, tramping us with horses, and releasing the tear gas. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. I had a concussion at the bridge. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. But I'm glad, I'm glad that God Almighty kept me here wouldn't let me die on that bridge. So I said to you, graduate, you have bridges to cross. And you're prepared to cross those bridges that you would cross. Get out there and help those that have been left out and left behind. Get out there and help leave this little piece of real estate, this little spaceship, a little cleaner, a little greener, and a little more peaceful for the generation yet unborn. You have a mission, a mandate, and a moral obligation to do what you can. And you can do it. We can do it. You can do it. This is your day. Let me tell you another little story, and I'll be finished. When I was growing up outside of Troy, Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, I had an aunt by the name of Cineva. And my aunt Cineva lived in what we call a shotgun house. I know you don't know anything about a shotgun house. You never see me. Don't try to fool me. <laughs> my aunt Cineva didn't have a green manicured lawn. Had a simple plain dirt yard. And sometime at night, you can look up through the holes in the ceiling and count the stars. When it would rain, she would get a pail, a bucket, or a tub and catch the rainwater. For those of you who may not know what a shotgun house is, in a nonviolent sense, it's an old house, one way in, one way out, where you can bounce a basketball through the front door and it will go straight out the back door. From time to time, my Aunt Steneva would bring us all together in her old house. And one day we were in her house, about 12 or 15 of us young children. An unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, the lightning started flashing, and the rain started beating on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. My aunt became terrified. She started crying. She thought the old house was going to blow away. She got all of us little children together and told us to hold hands. And we did as we were told. The wind continued to blow, the thunder continued to roll, the lightning continued to flash, and the rain continued to beat on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. And when one corner of this old house appeared to be lifting from its foundation, my aunt would have us to walk to that corner to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. When the other corner appeared to be lifting, she would have us to walk to that side. We were little children walking with the wind, but we never left the house. Call it the house of Hampton University. Call it the house of Virginia. Call it the house of Georgia. Call it the house of America. Call it the world house. We all live in the same house. It doesn't matter whether we are black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. We are one people. We are one family. We all live in the same house. We must look out for each other and care for each other. Go out there. 
and do what you must do. Stand up, speak up, and speak out, and get in the way. Thank you very much.